Good morning, church. Our scripture this morning is taken from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had approached Jerusalem, had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And the prophet said, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did this. Jesus instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he said to the coats, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is a prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Centuries before this day in the life of Christ, the events of this particular passage of scripture would be prophesied in the book of Zechariah. And the prophet would write in chapter 9 and verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This morning we're going to take a look at a very interesting time in the life of Christ because it is what many regard as the very beginning of the last week of his life on the earth going up into his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. This morning we're going to take a look at something that is often referred to as the triumphal entry, the triumphant entry. I wanted so much to change that particular title to something like Enter the King because that was what the prophecy was regarding, that was what it was talking about, and that's what the people for hundreds of years had been looking forward to, the coming of a king who would bring peace to their lives and salvation from their oppressors. But because it's often regarded as this, this morning we're going to take a look at the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem at the beginning of this, the last week of His life, leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to learn about this from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. But if you're taking notes, you might notice that Mark, Luke, and John also have something to say about this day. And so I've given you those passages of Scripture as well. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 44. And John 12, verses 12 through 16. Why is it a triumphal entry? Why is it a triumphant entry? Why, Kevin, do you want to call it enter the king? Because that's what's actually about to happen. You might remember that many times throughout Jesus' ministry, he was telling his disciples, don't tell anybody about me. Don't tell people what you just witnessed. Don't let them know about my healing power. And yet, words seem to spread all the more rampantly. We are now getting into the point at the end of Jesus' life where he is going to openly acknowledge who he is. Because who he is is why he came. And why he came was to be that sacrificial lamb 
on the cross for each of us. He is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the King. And the King has entered. Let's take a look at from the passage of Scripture, four signs that the King had arrived. Four signs that the people seemed to recognize that these were indicative of royalty. And we're going to begin in the first seven verses of Matthew 21 with the first sign, and that is regarding the animal on which Jesus entered. The animal on which Jesus entered. We read in Matthew 21 verses 1 through 7 that Jesus gives His disciples instruction to go and to get a donkey. In fact, the foal or the colt of a donkey. Now it's very interesting in Mark 11 and verse 2 and Luke chapter 19 and verse 30, these parallel accounts do not record anything regarding the mother of the colt, although Matthew mentions both the mother and the offspring. But that's not inconsistent. That's certainly not a contradiction. Mark and Luke are simply regarding or recording the animal on which Jesus actually rode. Not the mother, but the colt, the, the foal of the donkey. But why a donkey? Because if you are like me in my 21st century Western mind, that doesn't seem to be anything too impressive. Is this simply consistent with the humility that Jesus would often put forth regarding His own person? Does this have something to do about Him being subservient to others? And so He didn't ride some big fancy animal, but rather He simply rode on the colt of a donkey? No, there's more to it than that. Because whereas the Bible regards this as a beast of burden, and whereas we regard a donkey as a beast of burden, it was also in biblical times a symbol of royalty. Let me give you some examples from out of the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 5 and verse 10, we read, You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who travel on the road sing. This was a reference to people who were well-to-do, not those who are without. In fact, what we'll find is that horses and things of that nature were not as common in the Middle East at that time as they are in America today. And so we sometimes think about kings with, on horses or, or kings behind chariots and we have that picture in our mind that that's really what Jesus should be riding but maybe this is just His way of being humble. No, I want to suggest to you that this was His way of not only fulfilling prophecy but it was His way of demonstrating that He in fact was royalty and he was the king that had been prophesied of old. In Judges chapter 10 and verses 3 and 4 we read about Jer, one of the 15 judges of the Old Testament. And we read that Jer in verse 4 had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, not horses. And in fact the same thing is true in Judges 12 verses 12 through 13. We read about another judge by the name of Abdon. And Abdon, we read, had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. And he judged Israel for eight years. The greatest king in Israel's history, David, had a son who was also very well known, well known for his wisdom, well known for his riches and his power, and that was Solomon. And David said regarding Solomon on the point of his inauguration as king, he said, Take with you the seven the servants of your Lord and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. So what we have to recognize is this is probably not a point of humility as many of us have thought, but rather this is Jesus' way of letting the people know that He was in fact the Messiah prophesied of old who would come and be their king. Let's take a look at another sign that the king had arrived. And that is the garments on which Jesus entered. Now, you would normally think you wear garments, but in this case, Jesus actually sat upon and rode upon the garments 
that the people laid out before him. In verse 7 of Matthew 21, we read as Jesus, as they brought the donkey and the colt, it, we read that they laid their coats on them, and he, meaning Jesus, sat on the coats. And verse 8, most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. Once again, we might think that that might be a silly thing to do, to take a perfectly nice, freshly cleaned, laundered garment and put it on a beast of burden, or certainly to put it in the road ahead of him for the donkey to walk on. But again, realize what's going on here. The message that Jesus has sent forth, the people are accepting. They are recognizing that He is indeed special, that He is indeed unique, that He is in fact this person prophesied of old. And they are treating Him with unique specialness as He makes His entrance into Jerusalem. Would we do anything less? Think about that in our culture. Do we not have something called rolling out the red carpet? When somebody special, a dignitary, maybe the president comes to town, he comes off of Air Force One, maybe they have a red carpet laid out that he will take his first steps on. We certainly see that in other countries with kings and people of royalty. We even see this in some of our folklore when a prince finds a princess and she's about to step into a puddle of mud in front of her. He'll take off his coat and lay it over the mud so that she won't get dirty. Why? Because he is treating her with great love and fondness. He's letting her know she is special. This is what's happening to Jesus and it's certainly found otherwhere, elsewhere in Scripture. In 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 13, as Jehu is declared king, we read that they hurried and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. So we not only see Jesus riding in on an animal that would indicate royalty, but we see the people responding in like kind. His disciples and the crowd alike. What's the third sign that the king had arrived? Well this would be in regard to the branches on which Jesus entered. And we find this in verse 8. We read there that others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. In John's gospel account, in John 12 verses 12 and 13, we find that the branches were the branches of palm trees something that we here in Florida are well familiar with. But what does the palm tree represent? And what did it represent at this time? The palm trees represented a symbol of peace. And certainly this was something that the Israelites, the Jews, were crying out for as they felt so oppressed by the people around them, by the Romans around them, the people who had occupied Palestine. They felt oppressed. They felt the struggle. They felt the, the war that seemed to be occurring with them and others. And they were looking forward to someone who could bring about peace. And so they laid palm branches in the road. There's a very interesting passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 7. I would encourage you to look there with me. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. One of the many descriptions given of John's heavenly vision. And John writes in chapter 7 and verse 9, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Even the heavenly vision depicted emblems of peace. Not so much the peace that would be brought between warring factions in this earthly realm. Something that I'm confident that the Jews were looking forward to between them and the Romans. But this is the peace between man and God. A peace that has been under attack a peace that has struggled because of sin. But Jesus, the Lamb, 
the sacrifice for us, can bring our disharmony back into harmony. He can bring chaos into peace. And in whatever way the people understood Jesus' role, and I'm sure not all of it was accurate, they understood that He was the person prophesied of old who could bring peace. And therefore, they laid palm branches at His feet. What is the fourth sign that the King had arrived? That would be the shouts to which Jesus entered. And we read this starting in verse 9 where the crowds going ahead of them and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. Now we're used to words like hallelujah, but maybe you're not as familiar with the term Hosanna. In Vine's expository expository dictionary of biblical words, Hosanna is defined in Hebrew as to mean save, we pray. The word seems to have become an utterance of praise rather than prayer, though originally probably a cry for help. The people's cry at the Lord's triumphant entry into Jerusalem was taken from Psalm 118. And I've pulled two verses of Scripture that mimic what the people are shouting here out of Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, where the psalmist writes, O Lord, do save. We beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The the crowd shouts out, Hosanna, save us, we pray. And then they, like the blind men in last week's lesson, call out to Jesus in this way, Hosanna to the son of David, that great king in Israel's history. They are acknowledging that Jesus is more than just special. They are acknowledging His royal lineage from that great king of Israel over the united kingdom, David. And they say, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's very interesting. In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 25, there is a prophecy about this day and about the coming of Jesus that is demonstrated through this royal bloodline. We read in 1 Kings 8 and verse 25, Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David my father that which you promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked. This prophecy, this promise was something that the people understood for a long time. And they understand who Jesus is. But they are recognizing Him as more than the son of Mary. They are recognizing Him as more than the son of a carpenter, Joseph. They are recognizing Him from the royal bloodline of David. That's why Mark and Luke add just a little bit more to this, to the shouts of the people, than does Matthew. Mark chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, the crowd shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Luke would write in chapter 19 and verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Mark records that they're shouting out with Jesus' entrance into the city, not only is the king coming, that means the kingdom's coming. And Luke regards that peace that's represented in those palm branches that are laid on the road in front of him, peace. And both of them seem to talk about glory in the highest. There's nothing greater than the coming of the king. There's nothing greater than the coming of His kingdom. Because these represent peace. These represent salvation. And again, although the people would probably not understand the kingdom and the king as they ought to, they would have that opportunity to come to know it in time. Great and glory in the highest. 
The last two verses of our passage of Scripture come from Matthew chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. And in this, there are some, as Jesus entered, who are asking the question, who is this? Who is this person who is riding in like a king? Who is this person before whom the people are laying their garments and laying down palm trees and palm branches? Who is this person that the people are crying out, Save us, we pray. Hosanna to the King, to the coming kingdom. Glory in the highest. And in verse 11, the crowds answered by saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They've already declared him as a king. But it's very interesting that they are now declaring that He is the mouthpiece of God. A prophet is defined as one who speaks forth openly or proclaims a divine message. And after three years of ministry, after three years of preaching and teaching to the people, of answering questions of honesty, of answering questions of entrapment, demonstrating the power that was in Him to heal the sick, to make the lame whole, to allow the blind to see, to raise the dead to life. They are recognizing that this man who rides before them is someone sent by God Almighty. He is the prophet, the man of Nazareth, in Galilee. One of the questions that we should ask ourselves, those of us with 2020 hindsight, those of us who can turn back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read this story, those of us who can see with great clarity what the people were seeing on that day and perhaps with much better un insight than they understood on that day, how do we recognize Jesus? How do we receive Him in our lives? Is He a king? Is He someone we treat with great uniqueness and speciality? Do we treat Him as someone so much greater and higher than we are who has come here out of love to bring peace and salvation to our lives? It's an interesting thing that in just a few days, the crowd that cries, Hosanna, will be the same crowd that cries, Crucify Him. It demonstrates the fickleness of people. It demonstrates our inconsistencies. It demonstrates how weak we sometimes are based upon the pressures that are presented to us in the world around us. But can we see Jesus for who He was? Can we see Jesus for who He is? Can we see Him as our King? And can we see Him as the Lamb? The One who has come to the world, a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for our mistakes and to grant us entrance into His eternal kingdom where we can be saved in the presence of God forever and ever. Do we see Him that way? There's a television show Sherry and I have been watching recently and in the TV show there is a king and it's very interesting, I'm sure like many kingdoms, there are some people who recognize His royal authority and there are some who do not recognize His royal authority. And there are some who will try to undermine Him, some who are trying to sow discord among the people. But then there are some, whatever He says, they say, Yes, my King. Whatever He says, as you wish, my King. And they immediately go to obey their King. I hope I'm in that group of people. I hope I'm not in the other group that is undermining my Savior, 
who is trying to sow discord among the brethren, maybe not only by my words, but by the inconsistency of my actions. I want to be someone who stands before Jesus right here and right now who says, Yes, my King. Whatever you say, my King. I will do, my King. Because prophecy prophesied of you. You fulfilled that prophecy and you declared your authority. And in this, I will submit my all, my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. I will give you all as your servant so that you can bring me into that kingdom where I can abide with you forever. This morning, if you are not a Christian, one of the things that you are saying by your actions so far is, I don't want to be a part of that kingdom. Or maybe I don't know enough to be a citizen of that kingdom. The great news for you is while you have breath, while you have life, you have the opportunity to do what the crowds did on this day. And up to this point, they listened to the evidence. They observed the evidence. They analyzed the evidence so that when the king arrived, they recognized him. The king has arrived. Do you recognize him? If not, learn more about him in the only book in which you can, and that's the Bible. Believe it with all your heart. And based upon godly sorrow, that sorrow that is produced within us when we recognize our sin and we are sorry because we sent this perfect man to the cross in our stead, Repent of those sins. Confess the name of Jesus and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of those sins. And come up out of the waters of baptism a new creation, a clean soul, a citizen of the kingdom. And then serve the king as so many of us are trying to do. But if you're like me, you know that there are times when your thoughts aren't exactly what your thoughts ought to be. Your words aren't exactly what your words ought to be. Your actions betray you. Because what you do isn't what would please the king. As a member of the kingdom of heaven, as a citizen of the king, you have the opportunity to go to God in prayer with a penitent heart and ask for forgiveness. And sometimes it's helpful for others to pray with you and for you. And we certainly want to be able to do that for you today if we at all can. And if there are other things that are troubling you in your life, if those pressures are pushing in on you, if the world is trying to tempt you at every turn, and we can ha help you to stand up and stand strong just a little bit better, we want to do it. Because Jesus' triumphal entry into, Je into Jerusalem paved the way for our triumphal entry into heaven. And I want to be a part of that day when the angels rejoice and celebrate over what the King has done for us and over the gift that we've chosen to receive. Will you accept that gift this morning? And will you live your life in service to the King? Yes, my King. Whatever you wish, my King. I hope so. And if we can help you to do that just a little bit better. Let us know how we can. Together we stand and sing.